Hello and welcome to the football show. Uh, I'm Shane Stapleton. With me is Declan Bogue as ever. Declan, how are you doing? Great, Shane. Thank yeah, you. Thanks, thanks for uh, yeah. thanks for having me on again. Yeah, absolutely. You had um you had a busy old weekend with a birthday, a child's birthday, but you got some football in there too. Yeah, yeah. I got the I got as much as I could. Um, but any parents, young children, will realise that uh, it's just um, it's, a, it, it's its own reward really getting to see any kind of action on TV um, and competing with little baby bomb and all the other programs yeah yeah there was uh, some big results over the weekend of course you were at Donegal's victory over Tyrone 18-16 uh, mm. Dublin had a comfortable enough win over Roscommon for a finish 122-16 to Kerry hammered Galway we'll get into that of course I was down at uh, Kildare's victory over Cork uh, Mayo thumped down and uh, there was a few other results in between. But we'll start off uh, with Donegal against Throne. This was a first outing for Fergal Logan and Brian Doher. They lost by a couple of points. That Michael O'Neill red card just after half time was crucial and, and uh, that was something that the management were asked. He was already on a yellow and they were a little worried. Yeah, and um, <clears throat> well, you know, if you're looking at this game and you're examining it and saying, okay, that's Donegal Tyrone. They've met so many times. Like at one point, then you know Donegal since Jim McGinnis came, took over in in twenty eleven, uh, they defeated them in the Ulster final or Ulster semi final that day. That day, um, which kind of came out of nowhere, and really it was a situation whereby Martin Swift had collected a high ball. Tyrone looked in control coming down in the stretch in that game. Martin Swift caught a high ball. Michael Murphy charged into him with a tackle and dislodged it. And before you know it, was in the back of the net uh, by Dermot Malloy, right? That that was a decade ago. And they really, um, any time they met, then they met the following year. And I think again, and in, in, in maybe that was the first round in 2012. Yeah, first round in 2012, beat them down Clonus. And it, again, it was so narrow. Like it was uh, Martin Penrose had a shot for goal at the end. And Paul Durkin got his toe to it, and it came off like an upright. Uh, twenty thirteen was up in Bally Buffet. Donegal won that. Twenty fifteen, Donegal won that up in Bally Buffet. Then Mickey Hart had a run where, where he, he they beat Donegal in the final in sixteen, the semi final in seventeen, and beat them in a backdoor game up in Bally Buffet in twenty eighteen. Since then, Donegal have rested it all back. You know, Declan Bonner uh, last year, Donegal beat them in the league and then beat them in the championship. And then that was the way it was. Now, I don't know the scores to hand, but I'm not sure Mickey Hart would have conceded 18, or any team under Mickey Hart would have conceded 18 points. What that says is it was a completely different sort of uh, philosophy. But I think Donegal were a little bit compliant in that too, and maybe they were compliant for a reason, right? So first thing you noticed was that Tyrone, every time they got the ball, they were looking to give it to certain players who were kicking it long. And they really were moving it with purpose. And there was a, a far sort of bigger energy. Uh, and the boys were going in. Some of them were hopping. They were bouncing before they reached their ten and targets. But you had Connor McKenna was running in through and kind of getting on the end of those bobbles and breaks. And, you know, they, they could have done an awful lot better. They were very, very wasteful. I think the 12 or 13 wides in the game. But... There, that was the philosophy, was to get the ball forward as quick as possible, right? And what, if you think about Brian Doher as a player, like he was full of energy, full of running, full of effort. But Tyrone used to have a thing where when halftime went, they would charge down the tunnel, they would show no signs of weakness. They were big into body language. Cast your mind back to the time that Enda McGinley actually was hit in the All-Iron Final in 2003. Like, we now know that he broke a vertebrae in his neck, and Peter Kahneman was standing over the top and screaming, don't let them see that you're hurt. Get up, get up. Do not let them see that you're down. And he played on. But, you know, I'm not saying that the Throne players fell into some kind of a pattern under 
heart or uh, in later years. But when the halftime whistle blew, they were kind of trudging off the field and do her ran to the tunnel and started screaming at them, come on, come on, let's go, let's get in, run off, run off the pitch. And that might seem a very... Some people may think that's a very small thing. I don't. I don't think that. I think that's a massive thing. It's a signal of sort of intent that you know we've played 35, 40 minutes here and we're running off the pitch. We're sprinting because we are feeling fresh and we are feeling good about ourselves. And I think then that some of the trunk players now are going to have to maybe change their philosophy about body language because you know if anyone had a very significant positive body language, it was do her. Uh, I know I'm talking about Tyrone letting the ball in and the comparison would be, you know, when Mickey Hart was managing Tyrone, there was an awful lot of hand passing laterally outside of the 45 metre line because they were facing a, a packed defence. If Donegal had a packed defence yesterday, then you might have seen a bit more of that. Like Hugh McFadden, to great uh, effect it was in the 2018, 2018 Ulster Championship or 2019 uh, it kind of escapes me now, but the, maybe even 20, 2019, because Cal McShane won his All Star that year. Was Cal McShane was doing damage in the full forward line, and uh, Hugh McFadden just dropped in the midfielder, dropped in front of him as an extra sweeper, and caught everything. And Tyrone became very kind of one dimensional in that game and couldn't get anything. Now Hugh McFadden had to go off after ten minutes, came back on, but he was gone by half time again. Uh, if McFadden had been there. And had it been dropping into that position, would Tyrone then have kicked as many balls, or would they have been forced into playing the ball along the that line? So there's an awful lot to digest for that, you know. And the truth is that Tyrone did, you know, they're, they're certainly one of the teams that kept their their noses clean in the training band. They didn't do any training whatsoever collectively when they weren't allowed to. So can you judge them on three weeks training? Uh, no, it would be well. It'd be just it'd be foolery to judge them on it. But you can already see that there's a wee shift. There's a wee shift in, in uh, strategy here. Mm. And just a reminder, we're brought to you by orgoretro.com. If you want to get this Donegal jersey or any of the other ones, go to orgoretro.com. Put in the promo code our game. So just to to talk, how how crucial was that that red card for Michael O'Neill? I saw him bursting through in the first half. He possibly could have fed it on to Peter Hart. Maybe there was a goal on, but. You know, I mean, it's it's one of those flip of a coin things. Maybe taking a point was the ra- right option. And uh, Fergal Logan said he was just in line to come out that very second, but these are the calls you make. Um, mm. a, yeah, so number one, do you think that that decided the game? And number two, actually, I do agree with you on the body language thing. A team does need to build up an aura. Like, you look at Tyrone, and physically they're just so impressive. I think whatever it is about the white jersey, it re- the muscles really do come rippling out more than they might in other shirts. But, um, well, I mean, you know, even to, I know this a long time ago, like why did Armagh hire an image consultant to design their jerseys? Uh, people thought in 02 and 03 that they had these ultra tight fit. No, their jerseys in, in 02 or 03 you could have used as a sale. But the years after, in 04 on, they had hired or, or used, or I'm not saying hired, but certainly an image consultant actually advised them on how to have their jerseys and where the white flashes would be. And they had a very unique jersey to themselves, which we would call player fit now, but they were wearing a decade before any other team. And that was to create the aura. Absolutely. Like, and that's so, no doubt. So what are the things that really stood out to you about Logan and, and Doher in this match? I saw Kevin O'Brien at the 42 showing um, Tyrone pressing up at one stage and there was, I think, seven Tyrone players, give or take, in inside the 21 of Donegal. Yeah, and there was a lot of hurrying, and I think that coughed up a point for them uh, through Kieran McGeary, I believe. And uh, it's no kind of surprise. People have this half notion that they should have all these finishers on at once, uh, like a Lee Brennan and you know Cal McShane, Conor McKenna, and Darren McCurry, and all these. Fin- but you can only have so many certain type of forwards. Like they had Kieran McGeary in there. And he is a favourite of Logan and Doher. He was their captain on their 21s. Uh, and he's he's quite a good tackler. He he tends to give away a lot of frees. I don't know if that's just a timing thing or if it's just bad luck, but he is certainly a really tough kind of tackler and would have made his bones as a, a wing back. But 
he's playing up top and he's putting on pressure and they were certainly hunting in packs. There was a little bit of carry 3 about that move, that particular move, but they definitely were pressing. When it came to Donegal's kick out, they were pushing up high. And when you say, you know, what effect Michael O'Neill's sending off had, you can't play a team like Donegal with 14 men. They're just, well, they're just so in tune with each other. Like, you know, there's no rookies in that Donegal team. Like, you know, even the leg of an Oshin Gallon that came on, like he's been there around the panel now for the last three years. Jimmy Brennan's been around a long time. Pattern Mogan's had a full season under his belt. Like, uh, and then you've got these hugely experienced figures that like Murphy and McFadden. Uh, Sean Patton has been sensational. So he was able to find the extra man with the kick out. There's only so much of that pressing and narrowing the field you can do with 14 men. Now Morgan was pushing up to pick up an extra Donegal forward and those kickouts to try and commit, but that took a while. And in that, uh, Michael O'Neill was sent off in the 40th minute. In that quarter, before the water break, Donegal outscored to own 4-1. So that tells us deal. Um, they were able to commit more players forward. Pattern and Mogan all of a sudden wasn't so much worried with his defensive uh, duties and he was pushing forward and picked up a point and so on. So you can't, you just can't play a Donegal. They're just, they're just so tactically astute. Um, and they'll be absolutely furious with themselves over that Ulster final last year. Like I, I do believe that they're probably still the strongest team in Ulster right now. Do you, were you surprised actually? We can talk about all the players that did play it, but that Oren McNeilish didn't uh, get a run. I saw that he was named in the 26. Yeah, no, but I just think that was a, as far as I know, it's just a hamstring issue, just a wee tweak that he picked up in training. That he had, uh, I watched him in the warm up. He took a full part in the mm. warm up, like, but uh, I can definitely see him having a role there. Because you you'd be thinking that if you're going to go on and, and do big things this year, you'd need someone of his quality to get big game time now, so that he's ripe for the summer. Because he is, like, if he's fully fit, he is in their first fifteen, isn't he? I should think so, but. You don't know. I mean, sometimes players who are great and and, and uh, personally, I think Owen McNeilis is a great player. And and some people are mightn't say that they mightn't share that opinion with me because he's had a year out or a year in, and he was with America for a year, and then he went to uh, London and he sat out last year. Uh, and all those things are are you know symptoms of just how he was feeling or he wasn't feeling it or he didn't want to play a county player. I think he's a great footballer, but I think that similar to Tyrone, uh, like the Cal McShane wasn't in the match day panel. If you're not right, you're not right. And however important this league is, it's nothing to the championship. And they're probably trying to do all, the, all the, in their power to keep him nice and fresh and ready for championship football. And then on the Tyrone side of things, as you said, Cal McShane wasn't available to play. So hmm. if, if like, doesn't everything revolve around him being in the team, their success? Like, go back over the last number of years, who's been full forward? Mark Bradley, really good player, but possibly too small to be uh, a focal point. I know I'm obviously going back five or six years there. Then Sean Cavanagh, very good ball winner, great player over the years, but maybe he wasn't quite as mobile anymore. Then you have different mm. lads who've played in there in the meantime. But it clicks with Mac Shane. So is everything contingent on him being there? It does, but I expect them to be trying out a few more different formations. Like you saw very talented players on the bench and very talented players in the stand who didn't make the match day. What they have, like, I mean, we were talking coming into this game about a possible forward to of like McShane and McKenna. Nobody saw uh, Paul Donaghy coming, even though he was on the panel and so on, training panel. Like it was last summer where he won the the golden boot, so to speak, in the domestic championship. And he didn't get a call up for the county there. And I thought that was strange and odd. And I, I couldn't understand that because he arrived yesterday. Uh, I don't know where the stat came from, but it was that he was the highest scoring debutant ever in a throne jersey with, with 10 points. And I would say you'd be hard pressed to find a higher scoring debutant in league football in any county with 10 points. He was sensational. And he's a big man. Uh, and he kind of, I'm not saying that he's as a uh, sleek a mover as, say, a Norm McNeilis or whatever, but like in the first half, towards the end of that half, he was in the D. And there was about three defenders close to him. And most forwards would put off having a shot. Instead, he twisted and turned and found a wee bit of space and got on his left and, and put it over. And then in the second half, he really just kind of led the fight 
himself. Like there was no other thrown forward that was showing quite what he was showing. And he got two from play. And the second one outside of the right boot from outside the 45 metre line was a was a joy to behold. And then they'll have noticed that Dara Canavan, when he came on, was full of zip, full of vigour. Uh, he was fouled for free that was converted by Donaghy. Um, and they, thought, they might have thought, you know what, if he had got another 10 minutes, what he might have done. So, yes, McShane is, is is an asset and it would all click. But, uh, you know, if we were looking at this time when McShane won his All-Star in 2019, there was no Dara Canavan and there was no Conor McKenna and there was no Paul Donaghy. So the options are getting ever bigger, you know, ever increasing for Tyrone in that respect. I don't, I don't think that that's going to be where they fall down. Uh, and while they'll be getting a good bit of praise for you know, a new approach or people liked watching that, they did still concede 18 points. It's a massive figure and an awful lot of cheap frees. Uh, and they just, you know, they've got to tighten up on that. They've really got to tighten up on that. And they do have, like you mentioned, Dara Canavan, Niall Sludden came in as well. If you bring in Cahill McShane and then you now you, like, where does Paul Donaghy, does he start irrespective based on that performance there? You know, because there's so many good players, a few a few top stars are going to have to sit on the bench. Well, I'm sure that uh, Fergal Owen and Brian Deher will want to rotate the whole thing for Armagh this weekend. And that's natural. Of course, you want to just give everyone a shot and see where you are. I'm not so sure, though, that you, you, I just think maybe someone scores 10 points in their debut. You maybe give them the next game. Uh, and and him as well. You know, Sludden is class, Derek Hanavan's class. But you know that whole thing in soccer, I'd like a good big one ahead of a good small one. Yeah, that's well, and and they're not. They're sort of like yes, they could both. You know, Donaghy and Canavan could play in the inside line, uh, and Conor McKenna could be coming from deep. That's okay. Like uh, Richie Donnelly was tried up there, and he has been good full forward in the past for throwing in backdoor games. He was tried there. Uh, couple of times though when their balls head in his direction they weren't yeah i mean they're kicking the ball but sometimes they're kicking the leather off the ball like you know a couple of times the ball just bounced over richie Donnelly. like it wasn't the most measured of passes sometimes what they got away with though was they might have bounced over richie Donnelly's head and conor mckenna was coming like a train after it and, and getting on the second bounce or whatever um and and he will be disappointed a wee bit with how he finished because there's one kind of goal chance where he dribbled it just too close to Sean Patton. Another one where he just hit it into his arms. He bounced a shot into his arms. And uh, another one where he just drilled wide left of the post in the first half, which was uh, kind of was, you know, if you want to compare Donegal, you see the leg of Michael Langan. I'm not saying that they're prolific, but the leg of Michael Langan and Neil O'Donnell, Jimmy Brennan, they don't really seem to have a huge issue. Uh, they didn't have to work for their scores the way Tyrone did. Tyrone had to nearly carve them out and get them through the lines and kick to here and get a man coming off the shoulder and so on. Whereas Donegal were just working it patiently in their sort of wee RO formation that we've seen for years and years. And all of a sudden, a man comes in the loop and uh, a Kieran Thompson, Michael Langan, and all those boys are really comfortable striking it from 40 metres. McNeilis is another one that's extremely comfortable doing that. Uh, you you look at Paddy McBrady getting the ball down to the sideline and just swinging it over the shoulder. Like they have men that can kick points from serious distance, which kind of makes it a lot more easier for you. You know, knowing that, uh, as well as accuracy, eighteen points, eighteen scores they got, and what two three wides. I mean, that's that's fair going at this time of the year for Donegal. And when you when you're naming some of those strikers, brilliant left footers, Kieran Thompson, McBrady. Um, you named someone else there as well, Thompson McBrady and McNeilish, obviously. And then we didn't yes. even mention Michael Murphy. How how key was he to this? Oh, absolutely. I mean, he just did everything. Like, you know, I mean, he, there's a couple of times too where the big high ball was sent in and the two captains were marking each other, the new captain, Paddy Hamshie and uh, Murphy. And maybe Hamshie shaded the odd aerial battle, but at the same time, the ball went in for Donegal's last score and he just held off. Um, so he's just he's so strong he's so dominant he was winning kickouts he was just kicking for he was just doing everything he's just a typical michael murphy you know it was a, a nine out of ten performance again by him and everyone expects him 
to be nine out of ten. It's just a, a, a given for him. Uh, he kind of got involved in a wee bit of uh, verbals with Brian Doher along the line too, which really? shows that uh, even though the face has changed, like the the relationship between these two remains the same in some respects. Mm. Yeah, um, I spent a fair bit of the early part of the hurling show alongside Michael Verney giving out stink and throwing hissy fits about the rules, and I didn't want to start on that point here, but the um, the black card rule and the you know the sin binning and all this kind of stuff. Anthony Cunningham, like he was very very angry after the game with uh, Dublin as Ross Common boss. They give away three penalties. Cormac Costello got one one out of those three penalties, but um, you know it's all about like. Uh, you know, cynical fouls inside the 20 metre line or arc can be punished not just by a sin bin but a penalty if the ref adjudicates a goal scoring chance has been denied just for anyone who, who isn't fully up with the rule and Cunningham said I think it wasn't a rule that was required in the game at all it's ridiculous that the rules committee come up with these rules year on year to try and mess with the game I'm also reliably told that there isn't a top class referee on the rules committee which is startling and there was certainly nobody in the inter-county uh, coaching asked so he was. He was. At, he also said that uh, players being dragged down blatantly was more of a hurling issue. Now he's former county hurling manager as well and a selector with the Dublin hurlers. So he obviously knows both codes inside out. Now Mick Gallagher, yeah. who was deputising for the suspended uh, Desi Farrell, he said it's a forwards game now. Once you get the ball and stick it under your arm, you go direct at goal. Like should it be a forwards game? And if so, why? Oh, well, it, it, the rule changes has made it so. The rule changes has been pathetic mm. towards defenders. Um, heading towards basketball here. I, I, I don't know. Um, I, 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 I am kind of sick of this point because in some ways, like the uh, standing committee on playing rules have been trying to change something that's just not there in some respects. I mean, there's no way that anyone could tell me that watching the All-Ireland Hurling final of last winter that, that there wasn't a number of incidents where Waterford players weren't prevented from getting into goal scoring positions. Am I right? Yeah. Oh, it happens. Yeah. It happens well, in Ireland all the it's time. It's there. It's it's absolutely there. Uh, and like, you know, in the discourse of all these kind of you know, journalists will seek out managers and players and there'll be opinion columns written and there's no doubt about it that Limerick's physicality was cited in a lot of these kind of conversations and columns and interviews. So John Kelly is naturally going to rail against it because he sees it as being persecuted. But that happens with successful teams. It happens all the time with successful teams. I mean, really, that kind of swarm tackle when a midfielder catches the ball was Tyrone's sort of a imprint that Mickey Hart brought to the game and like in time then that was changed uh, I think Jarrett Burns was the, was the chair of the stand committee and playing rules so it was that you got a midfield mark uh, and then you know Stephen Cluxton's kickouts were obviously he was having a 100% rate because he was able to put it wherever he, he could to his Dublin backs and they, they made that change then that they made an alteration that you had to be a certain distance or you had to be in this position to receive the ball and you couldn't give the ball straight back to the goalkeeper. Um, that that tends to happen. Uh, and I think that a lot of, and I'll, not naming names, but I'll say this, there were journalists at the Antrim Clergium that didn't really appreciate that new rule or the vagaries of that new rule, right? The, the drag down and, and penalty. And I would say it has caught out an awful lot of football people. I've talked to people who have no interest in, in uh, hurling, but had no idea that what they thought was the new hurling rule applies to football. And it's astonishing because uh, it, it's just, Kieran McGinney put it best, and he says, like, you know, it's, it's just made the referee's job harder and harder again. Like, And there's so many things to determine with it. Uh, was there a goal scoring opportunity? Can you say if you had a certain type of cornerback who's just happy to do man marking and he found himself one on one with a fella and he kind of got half past him, is that still a goal opportunity in the way if it was Michael Murphy that got past the last defender and got dragged around? You know, you you know then then you're into then you're into your own perceptions of players to make a rule on a penalty. Like it's it, just it absolute head. madness. But it, all these, not, nothing is as bad as the forward mark, Shane. Oh, it's, look, it's absolutely terrible. It's I saw a couple of instances of just a sideways ball 
nobody even pressuring these players. They're just on their own. One kicks it to the other 20 yards. The arm go up in the air. I mean, I'm not a massive rugby fan anyway. So when I see this, I just think it's rugby, Mark. Stop making it like rugby. Stop making it like Australian uh, rules. Gaelic football is an absolutely brilliant sport. So please stop bastardizing it. I had a, a conversation about uh, Johnny McGurk and James McCartan uh, playing each other in the. Uh, uh, it was the massacre in the in, in the in, in the marshes in nineteen ninety three, and and the whole thing was all the balls were played up the line to James McCartan was getting it, and he was turning and then going at it, or Mickey Lennon getting the ball, turning, facing up to the defender. What way is Kieran McKeever going to go here? How are they? This is the contest. This is Gaelic football here now, like you know. And instead, that doesn't happen now. I, I David Hassan chaired the that particular stand committee on playing rules, um, and I've yet, I've yet to hear anybody actually saying that this has helped Gaelic football or this has improved it as a spectacle. Uh, and as Kevin McDaniel said last night, in the Sunday game, you are rewarding now someone securing the ball. And that's just, it's pathetic. Like it's it's one of the worst rule changes there's it's there have been. been At what point does it change? Like are we just gonna tolerate this for another two three years till someone get then gets it back on the car at uh, Congress or wait for another rule change here? Uh, that's completely unclear, and it's not getting football. It's nothing like it. No, I have a problem with all three penalties. If I'm honest with you, the first one I think is Paddy Small gets bundled over by Brian Stack. And whatever about it being a cynical tackle, I think you can, you know, again, you have to be somehow in the player's head to decide if that was cynical. But there's, a, like, as Paddy Small is going over right on the edge of the 14, there's another defender in sight. Now, Conor Callahan is probably going to be able to receive possession and convert it. That's absolutely fine. So maybe there is a goal scoring opportunity, but there's mm -hmm. certainly a defender back. The second one, Darren Mullen, I think, is more or less on the end line when his man pulls him down. Is it a goal scoring opportunity when you're there? I mean, that was my take on it. And then the third one was Brian Fenton was taking a shot. And I think it was Niall Daly had a trailing foot. Like, it was clearly a foot block, but he's so far away from the player. Is it really a full foot block in the way that it's intended to be I, a fraction? As someone that enjoyed doing a good old foot block uh, in, 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 in uh, reserve football, <laughs> I always found you got away with it because referees just didn't... <laughs> They didn't really notice at that level, but a foot block to me is when you run alongside someone and, and they're about to take it, and you get, you literally try to nip it off their toe, or you put your leg out there. If you're yards away and the ball's had to travel at least two, three yards, that's not a, it's not a foot block to, to me. It's not a foot block, and I don't have the Terry Figial in front of me to make that determination. Maybe that's what the rule book says, but. Uh, the other thing is, Shane, you know, are we being, and is everyone being hard on referees given that it's been six months since they last took charge of a game too and they've been told, look, there's a new suite of rules here for you. You have to make all these decisions too. Uh, I, I, I just, it's hard for them. It is desperate hard for them. Big time. So when, when we're looking at these and going, that's not a penalty, that's not a penalty, yeah, we have to absolutely take into consideration. We're giving referees an impossible job. And it's not like referees are paid a fortune here either. It's not like, you know, Mark Clattenburg in the Premier League and he goes off and he's basically a bit of a, a media baby after that and probably making a nice little living on the side. It doesn't happen like that with referees. So I think they just got an impossible task. And the people in the standing rules committees in boat code, relating to boat codes, need to just say, put their hands up in the air and say, look, some of these things we got wrong. And other people who are pushing for some of these rule changes, whether it's in the media, former players, whatever, you really need to think of the unintended consequences. And I had this problem with the penalty idea in the rule. I was screaming like till my face was going blue, trying to say, do not do this. If you're going to do anything, it has to be cynical foul anywhere in the field as a penalty. Otherwise, you have to weigh up all these things instantaneously as a referee. You just need to be able to say, was that cynical? Right, it is penalty and cynicism gone overnight. That's my opinion. Now, whether more and more simulation comes in is another thing. And that was something that John Kiley was giving out about. Anyway, I want to bring in something positive about the likes of, uh, like Dublin. They were absolutely sensational in their accuracy. And look, if people want to talk about the funding, they can and all that kind of stuff. But let's just analyse the football for now. They scored 23 times from 27 shots. 85% efficiency is unbelievable. So 
that's what Ross Common are up against. But to be fair to them, from the first water break, I think they were down seven and a man down. Then they went from there until the 55th minute, a point up. So that's, that's unbelievable when you consider 20 of those minutes were about 14 men considering black cards. Yeah, yeah. And it, gonna though, what's more interesting there is, is what you say about their, their conversion rate, right? And that has been, if you have Dean Rock who, who is kicking the percentage of, of, of dead balls that he is, and you have that conversion rate in a team that has lost Paul Mannion, uh, you know, there was one moment in the game at Hyde Park yesterday where Conor Callaghan was, was through for a point. He could have took a point and he gave the eyes like he was looking at the posts. But still, even though like it would have been a handy one for him to stroke over, there was a player just in front of him and, and there might have been a 20% chance that he might have got a little bit of a fingertip on it. He still turned right round and he gave it to Kieran Kilkenny to kick completely unhindered over the bar. So, I mean... This is where you get. This is the difference in Dublin, and the the, the, the other teams that are trailing. Uh, whatever you want to say about Kerry, it was a virtual show attack and performance by Kerry against Galway. But there is nothing that that drives managers to distraction than a slight selfishness uh, creeping in. I mean, whether that be that they just didn't see, they didn't hear. There was one point where Michael O'Neill for Throne he got a point. But he should have played in Peter Hart, and that might have been a goal. Now, I'm not saying that he should have done that. Maybe Peter Hart wasn't roaring hard enough for it, and maybe his awareness wasn't there. But like Dublin, just don't miss things like that. I mean, the the, the idea of how many palmed goals they get at the far post, like because a player runs it in, and then they're there just to smack it home, and they never miss. I mean, you know, we saw another palmed goal attempt that just hit the upright and yeah, went away on them. Yeah, I mean, you know, I just, David Clifford got one where he had to raise high and slam dunk it almost. Um, you know, the, the, when you have a team like that, they're just completely unselfish. That any trace of selfish just means then that you might sit out the next game. Then that's, that's just a hallmark of them. And arguably that's why uh, Cormac Costello hasn't always been in the team because maybe he hasn't always given the ball off. But just to c contrast that conversion rate, the shot, shooting efficiency of 85%, 23 to 27. The game I went to Cork against Kildare this weekend, I thought it I, uh, just so happened I thought that up for both teams. Cork were 14 of 29 and Kildare were 14 of 26. Now they scored 212 and ended up winning uh, 212 to 14 points. But, you know, you're looking at a little bit... And Tyrone, Tyrone were 16 out of 28. Well, there you go. All teams are creating similar, you know, in the high 20s, give or take. And yeah. And what Dublin are doing compared with these other teams. Like, it's it's great. Did you have Donegal's as well or just Tyrone? Donegal were 18 out of 21. Well, so that's, that's can, really good. Yeah, they created a lot less. But, yeah, they're creating far fewer chances. So, um, yeah, I wonder, can Cormac Costello nail down a spot? Or is it, it's going to be the usual thing, flick of a coin, and probably Dean Rock will probably get the nod. Yeah, I mean, it's just... Dean's free taking record in big games just edges that uh, he's just one of the well, as Jose Mourinho would call it the untouchables wasn't it like the undroppables like you just don't drop Dean Rock he's 31 now he'll be playing until he's about 34 35 I expect because uh, he's so sprightly he never gets injured he's robust and durable and he's just got that that free taking thing that only just gets better and better with age and interestingly, as you pointed up, just pointed out just before we started, Dublin were the only team that broke the COVID ban that we know of, that, uh, certainly that got sanctions, that actually won. So it was... Uh, yeah, I mean, that was just something we we noted um, in our conversation before we came on air. But Monaghan uh, got off to a dreadful start against Armagh. Uh, and... They had Fintan Kelly and Doran Hughes and Conor McManus and other established players. Like I mean, basically, I think the front six from Monaghan were more or less hadn't. Well, they were, they were just very inexperienced. Like you know, Armagh and Michael Bangan. Uh, for enough, you Conor McCarthy there, Young Jones and Woods. Like there was an awful lot of a uh, inexperience in that team in that forward position and forward lines. Now whether, but Banty. Or whoever's picking the team this weather wants to just you know keep the powder dry yet 
maybe he's just, you know, there's, there's a lot of maize in the clock there for, for McManus, Hughes, the protector, and, and Kelly, and maybe they're just trying to keep things downplay expectation right now. Down, obviously, uh, the fallout of their them breaking the ban, maybe they're always going to be beaten by Mayo, but my God, like it was it was a real lesson for them. Uh, and, and like, you know, they, they, they already one game in just appear in trouble. And of course, Cork then just, you, you tell me, like, was it just a general flatness then? Uh, it was because there are other teams that did well over the weekend. Yeah, Cork were frustrated. Remain right? nameless that have been doing plenty collectively. <laughs> like, yeah, there's no doubt about it. I mean, you'd be naive to try and, to be thinking that teams weren't meeting up and doing stuff. But it was the manner of the defeat for Cork that uh, that would frustrate them. The way they lost to Tipperary last year, you can imagine the abuse they got locally, you know, or the criticism they got from people after losing to Tipperary with the hard work done. So to come out, put themselves in a good position. I think they were they were five points to three up. Daniel Flynn goes off injured for for Kildare. Players moving pretty well, and you think right they're in a, they're in a good uh, situation now, and they can kick on and win this game. But it was it was Kildare who turned it around, and like they're the ones who got conceded five goals to to Mead in the Leinster semi final last year. You know Jack O'Connor's coming back in, and then because you lose like that, and you're not exactly you didn't get promotion in the league. People think maybe he's yesterday's man. It's you know it's quite a long time since since they since he made those strides with Kerry. Obviously he did good stuff at underage. But then despite Daniel Flynn going off, Kevin Flynn gets a goal. Jimmy Highland gets a goal. Dara Kerwin is excellent. Like the players really stepped up. Neil Flynn came in and he was really good. Now they didn't score the last 18 minutes, including injury time, but they were very good. But for Cork, no Mark Collins, no Luke Connolly, Brian Hurley goes off injured. It yeah. Really, it, it's, it was definitely a frustrating outing for them. And to lose in that manner, and like they got the last five scores of the game to sort of right. put, a, put a better look on it. But uh, geez, Cork looked a, a, a fair bit away from being able to shock Kerry once again this year. Uh, I'd have to say that, but for Kildare, that was that was that was impressive. And actually, Daniel Flynn went off with a hamstring injury. Any player's season could be very quickly over just due to one hamstring injury. Yeah, any kind of soft tissue injury, like you know, normally can be nursed from championship game to championship game because it might be two or three weeks break in, in that time. But just the bang, bang, bang nature of all this, like any player that's not going well, it is. It is amazing, though, just when we observe these teams now over a two-week and three-week period, just where the flatness comes or where the flatness starts or, you know, what kind of statement performances are delivered off the back of, of uh, poor ones. Um, I, I kind of might have thought that Cork were ready to rock and roll a wee bit more this year uh, and get themselves in, in, in serious order. But I, I'm just surprised with the flatness there. I'm just surprised. And... and you know, I don't know. It's uh, it's just a we we are dealing with a situation where we've never saw we've never seen this before, where you're just straight into a national league after six seven months of doing nothing, and then you're told you've got three weeks now to prepare. Um, if I can be as indulgent, even just to talk about my own county for a second, like Fermanagh beating Calvin, like, <clears throat> and you'd be delighted for Ray McManaman because he had to take an awful lot of criticism and uh, Tomás Corrigan wasn't able to commit and he clearly was their most important forward last year. Uh, Rory Corrigan's injuries just mounting up and he, he's just been unable like, to, to really put it together. Uh, Alton Cam, who was meant to be going to Australian Rules before lockdown, he wasn't there for the game. Uh, and then you had Ryan Jones, Conal Jones, who Garvin Jones who just won't be about this year they're they're opting out for the year so like they were losing an unbelievable amount of experience and put in a lot of young lads that have been involved with that Hogan Cup in 2019 for St Michael's but like from what I'm hearing they absolutely tore into Calvin and the Ulster champions uh, I don't know Mickey Graham just said more hunger more everything uh, you know, were Fermanagh any better prepared? Were Fermanagh just sticking to what they were good at? And it almost feels like, right, even though Logan and Doher are fresh management, this is Ray McManaman's fourth year involved with Fermanagh, but it almost feels like he's come with a brand new team with the like of Josh Largo-Ellis, 
Luke Flanagan, so on. A lot of these boys who made their debut at the tail end of last year when COVID was running through the panel. Uh, and that goes then for Jack O'Connor. Is this now a whole new, you know, maybe the extended break, the lack of pre-season and all that, feels, it all feels brand new to the Jack O'Connor. You know, it could have felt that way for Ron McCarthy too, or maybe they're just unsure of where they are right now. As a Fermanagh man, were you expecting, like, it's a surprise victory as far as most of the country would be seeing it, but were you expecting that? Did you hear no. any words of no, that? No, no, nobody I'd been talking to in the county would have, uh, there, there wouldn't have, without putting too fine a point out, nobody would have given them a single chance beating Calvin. They just wouldn't. They just would have felt that Calvin, that assurance now of being champions, uh, just would have had too much for a very raw-looking team, young-looking team. Uh, but like the, there was a spikiness there, and Sean Quigley coming back into the panel and scoring nine points, and that's just uh, that's just heroic stuff again from him. And he hasn't lost anything. As a matter of fact, <laughs> as a way of these things now with modern day technology, everybody was on their Strava and doing their Strava runs, and the times that he was posting for five k's and ten k's were. I don't know if you have an appreciation of how fast some of these things can be run, but he was running them at a serious clip altogether. So he has done an awful lot of work on himself over the past six, seven months. And uh, I don't know, I'm not sure who is marking him, whether it be Paddy Faulkner or whatever, but my God, he um, he, he was uh, he, he just turned in one of those kind of career performances, nine points, my God. And there's some to own imprint in Ulster football at the moment. Ryan McManaman um, in the McGinley with Antrim, and obviously Lowther in um, Leinster, but Mickey Harris mm. over there as well. No deeper than that, Shane, though. No, you've got Stephen O'Neill. Uh, you know, he's, he's Andes, Andy McGinley's selector. Uh, Stevie Quinn is, fr- like, he wouldn't be known to people because he didn't play county football, but he's a brilliant trainer, and that's who Anda has as his trainer, Stevie Quinn from Argyll Cairn. Uh, You've got Paddy Talley, and Paddy also has a couple of uh, Tyrone men as selectors and trainers in uh, Archie Beattie and uh, Gavin McGilley. Again, weren't kind of players, so people wouldn't know, but it kind of speaks. Then you've got Ray McManaman, then Joe McMahon left for Mana to let, hook up back with Tyrone. Uh, it kind of just speaks of the coaching um, culture, maybe, in the county. Uh, it just kind of, you know, obviously, you know, the amount of people that came out of that Tyrone team in, in the noughties, it, it, it would speak to me that, you know, this is a team that were able to make a certain amount of decisions for themselves on the field, independent of thought. And that's when things really went well for them in their prime heart would have actually given a lot of credit to the players making all the moves and switches and that on the pitch themselves, figuring out things for themselves. Mm. And Mickey Hart obviously got off to a win and start beating Leitrim with Loud. Uh, a word on um, on a Fermanagh native, Rory Gallagher with Derry, who absolutely annihilated Longford. I'm not sure if you saw much of the game, but that's a thumping win and a very big scoreline. Didn't see it, but it wouldn't surprise me. Um, Rory would have got, like, you know, I mean, he Rory... <laughs> If you know Rory Gallagher, like he, he he needs football, like people need oxygen, like he he would have locked in, he would have absolutely killed him, like he just wouldn't be used to that at all, and he would have been, uh, he would have been out making sure that the Derry players were were doing the right thing over lockdown, all that kind of thing. But it kind of goes back to you just don't know last year how you're gonna receive your players and what kind of condition Gavin Devlin said that uh, in an interview there last week that whenever the Trone players came back in to get ready for the last two rounds of the league he says he went through the drill on the first night back and he says he couldn't believe it he says the energy was in their boots he went away to talk to the county chairman because he was so upset that just how just slow people were moving I suppose Um, and uh, with, with Derry I don't know how the the they finished up with that, but you know, even someone like Chrissy McKeg has been around for a long time playing for Derry, and it said that Rory Gallagher has been, you know, putting in place different things that they needed to compete, and one of those things was just sheer physical work that that had to go in, and then they played Longford and and, and annihilated them 
it'll be interesting now to see just how it goes when they play for Mana in, in Owen Beg this weekend because you know Rory knows those players inside out and he'll have a plan for Sean Quigley, no doubt. But uh, it could be it could be it could be saucy enough on the sideline between him and Ray McMahon. I'd love that to be made up anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, twenty one points to five there, so that's a serious scoreline for Derry and very, very poor for Longford. Uh, a quick word on, on Mayo against Down. So two twenty one to one eleven. We already touched on it. What stood out to me is two things. Number one, the absolute size of Tommy Conroy. He got a great goal, but he looks so beefed up. And I wonder, is that part of his evolution? Last year, he looked like a really tasty corner forward, but looked a little bit slight. And I don't know, maybe it's a trick of the jerseys or whatever it might be. I don't know, Shane, because it's very easy to, to do that now. And uh, appreciation of the science that players have. And then it's all down to your dedication to it. I mean, you know, Con O'Callaghan, I think, emerged in 2019 with this, what people thought was a brand new body. Really, he had beefed up somewhat. The biceps got bigger uh, and his chest got enormous. But the shaved head helped it too in a tighter jersey. I'll be honest. Uh, I'm, you know, obviously I've shared a dressing room with him for since 2014, I think, at this point at club right. level. And I never. And you I never, tell us, like, I mean, did did you did he walk through the gates and you say, "Who's this hunk?" No, not at all. Because to me, it was a gradual thing the whole time. It's a bit like, um, you know, you live with someone for years, and all, you know, you don't realise that they're getting older looking or whatever, or they're getting getting fatter or whatever it might be. So You're it's, not married yet, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, 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 no. What an insensitive comment to make. I could be talking about anyone. Anyway, so the point being is that. I'm looking at him for years, so this kind of, all of a sudden, someone wouldn't yeah. have seen him and looked at a before or after photo, and you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, he does look way different. But to us, like, you're looking at a guy just gradually improving and getting bigger and stronger. He was always in great nick, and there's part of it just going from 18 to 19, 20, 21. You just get that little bit bigger. But to me, it was no overnight thing. It wasn't a couple of months sort of thing. And maybe that's just the same with uh, Conroy. Maybe he was just packing a little bit more on it, and now all of a sudden, having not seen him in six months, Maybe it looks a bit more pronounced. Well, that's what two lockdowns does too. Like if you if you were able, if you had a good sports science backroom team there, and they said, "Okay, right, we need to get you from here to here." Uh, I'm not sure who it was, but I think it was Andy Moore was talking about the court players when he was away in an All Stars tour, uh, or yeah, it was an All Stars tour, I think, saying what they were doing in the gym, and he it, it the skills fell from his eyes a wee bit because he realised, God, I have to get an awful lot bigger, an awful lot stronger, I have to do all this. And someone dedicated like like Andy can do that. But some of these young lads are, you know, have the, uh, well, there's a certain, there's a certain chemical in the body that actually releases. Damien Casty, the former dairy manager, uh, was explaining to me once that you can make huge gains at that age because the body is ready to adapt. So if you ha know that you're sitting and looking at another lockdown that's going to last five months, you know, that's an awful lot of w weeks there to look at your diet, to look at your training, to look at your sleeping. It, you know, that's the one thing that the body needs in order to beef up like that is the rest and recovery. And it doesn't, it doesn't surprise me that an awful lot of players have made enormous physical leaps in this time. Because too, like, you know, the first lockdown, it happened and people weren't sure for a couple of weeks as to what to do and like some counties were trying Zooms with, with 32 people in the Zooms trying to do a, a hit session, which is grand. It's only really opening up the pores. Like that's, it's not doing much more than that. And in that time, then people obviously went and got themselves kitted out with a home gym in the garage and all that. Now, when it came for the second lockdown, they realised, well, we've got this all here. We've got to actually make better use of it. So, yeah, that's it is a feature that we've seen. Mm. And I also wonder, um, from panel to panel, how players use that time to, to stay fit and go running. So just club level, I give my own personal example. I was going doing runs and, and what have you, and you're tipping away, and you think, you know, I'm going hard enough, and then in more recent weeks, I was kind of, I'd bump into a housemate, we'll say, and go running with somebody else. And you'd feel, geez, I'm kicking on. I have a nice blowout done there. I have a bit of, a bit of uh, ball work done as well. I won't be too bad when I go back training. You go back training then and you're panting. You are like panting. So the first day, it was heavy enough going. There was a lot of ball work, but like a lot of running, you know, built into it. You know how these things are. How smart well, tell me, like, this, there's, there's two things about that. And what I've spoken to 
not to name names, but uh, say for example, a uh, and I know this like this, someone told me about like uh, like Michael Murphy mm. and, and Neil McGee in particular. There's, there's two like if they were asked to do a five k, they would just say no, no way, not doing that. That's just not that's not relevant to me. An awful lot of counties were doing that. They were just sort of doing five k runs or ten k runs and stuff like that. Whereas Murphy and McGee would just refuse to do it. Uh, so God knows how quick they would have been at them. Uh, God knows if they if they were actually doing the right thing, just doing football training, weight training, uh, taking a bag of balls down and going through drills themselves down the local pitch or out in the backyard, and like you know. So it's it's and and some people favour the long distance stuff, and it works for them. Uh, say, even like Larry Larry Tompkins' book, Larry when he was with Kildare, I think they played a big game, and the, who it was against, I think it was Jack O'Shea. That perhaps he he sought his advice and said, like, you know, what can I do to get better? And he said, weights and long distance running. And the long distance running, quite a lot of the time, was actually it was mentally, it was for the for the mental benefit of that to know that well, I can run a ten k, and then I can do a ten k the following day, and that's that's fine. You know, that's okay. Like people get people get overawed by the idea of running maybe eight mile, ten mile. It's not that hard, like. You know, it's not hard for the leg of me, an ex-smoker at 42, to go and do that. You know, so it shouldn't be hard for lads in the prime. No, and but it's one thing doing doing those 5Ks and those 10Ks. I've never enjoyed doing those. I don't think it ever even suited me. Um, even when I was a younger fella and you'd be able to run endlessly, you know, for 70 minutes of a GEA match or an hour at club level, whatever, it never suited me. But the point I was getting to is I did all those runs and a lot of it was like shuttle runs, you know, 100 meter runs, turn, wait 20 seconds, go again, that sort of stuff. And some of it would be sprint work and change direction and all that. But there is no preparing for coming back to be to doing ball work, to getting knocked around the place, to getting hit. So there's probably going to be... It's a question in turning. Yeah, all oh, big time. And it's like the, the physio, uh, Marty Lochran, on a couple of interviews with me and he, he had been... Uh, physio for Irish Olympics uh, team in, in 2012 and he was based he's based in uh, Cookstown which is on the Throne and Derry border right and he told me that Derry had uh, last year after lockdown they had a championship which was based on a group stages thing right nobody got knocked out of it but you got to play your group stages which was whatever number of games and that determined your seeding then for the knockout so anyone that was carrying sort of niggles, the rest of them throughout the group stages or give them a week off, or whatever. And then in Tyrone, it was still into a full league program and then championship. But in Tyrone, the league has played with such an intensity that everyone was pushing players through. What he noticed was the injuries that were coming to him from Tyrone clubs was almost three times what was coming to him from dairy clubs. Soft tissue injuries, which is just over... Uh, over just asking the body to do too much in too short short a space of time to get ready for games so that's a wee bit too like of what we're looking at here now is there's a little bit of that you know with with players at inter county level yeah well like so after the first session which was tough then just to briefly wrap that point up when we did the two days later we did the warm-up for the second session so you know it was a new level going into training and drills change of direction all that kind of stuff during the warm-up i was like how am i going to get through this session because the legs just were not used to it. And I reckon a lot of players, they're kind of going from week to week now, like, or even just going from training session to training session, their bodies might be in a little bit of survival mode. Maybe they're just about getting up to speed now, but the legs are gonna definitely be feeling it. And they're definitely well, I mean, running on tar, and then with a pair of football boots on, you run through grass, you, you know it's different anyway. It sucks, your, it sucks the power out of your calves and your quads anyway. But it's the twisting and turning. It's when you get the ball down a wing and a man is flaying in from one side and you have to suddenly stop. And that's what, what Marty Lochran said. It's the decelerations. Yeah. yeah well, Not even the, getting off the, the mark quick. It's the, it's the slowing down, twisting your whole body, shimmying, moving. Like nobody's hitting you a rattle of a shoulder 5K into a 10K run. And you know, there's, there's plenty of drills now in warm-ups where you're, you are doing that deceleration stuff. Like, it's gone to that level. I suppose that's no surprise to most football people out there, not to mention hurling people too. But one final point I wanted to make on Mayo Down before we move on is, is this a sign that Kerry will stop making hard work, or sorry, Mayo will stop making hard work of every single game they played? They just put down to the sword. And, you know, there was no messing about it. You know, none of this 
tight game. You know the way last. Well, maybe it's a symptom of being in Division Two as well. Well, they're in Division Two. That yeah. that wraps that one up really. But like, yeah, Mayo in you know in Division One were prone to lapses in concentration and all those kind of things. And, Even in qualifiers. Uh, Sorry. Yeah, even in qualifiers, think how many times they were taken to extra time by sides that were probably ranked well below them. So yeah, maybe this is a sign of a change, uh, folks, from them. So just to move on to the final game, then um, Kerry four twenty one, Galway eleven points. So just to quickly run through some of the scores, everyone knows about David Clifford's unbelievable drag back and goal, but he scored three six. Sean O'Shea, Sean O'Shea got seven points, or Sean O'Shea as they like to call him. Paddy Clifford got one two. Killian Spillane four points. Um, uh, Paul O'Shea and Tommy Walsh they got a point Paul Conroy he got a few points so did Damien Comer and Shane Walsh but it was triple scores I mean yeah. if you, you convert it down it's 33 to 11 and when I added this up right now we'll get on to Peter Keane's comments in a minute but since the pandemic uh, since we were allowed, teams were allowed back playing you go back to last year Galway they were top of the league then it, they came back they got hammered by Mayo then they lost to Dublin in the league at home. Then they lost narrowly to Mayo in the championship, to be fair. And then they got annihilated the other day against Kerry. Three of those four games at home in Salt Hill. But the aggregate of those games since coming back is 56 points to 973, which is 100 points. So they've Ooh. lost every game on average 14 points to 25. Like this is an absolute why? meltdown since coming back. And it's, it's hard to know exactly why, but everyone can see it. Um, just like you know, uh, and, and 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 sure, here we're just talking, aren't we? We're just chatting. Just what I'm gonna say about, about and, and I'm not robbing somebody's stat, I hate to do this, but uh, I don't know. I saw it on Twitter earlier, whether it be Rob Carl or somebody, whoever it is, I apologize, but they said that that score 33 4 was the 33 11. Yeah, was the highest score there's been. Could that be right, like in in national league football and championship? You'd have imagined somebody would put up like seven or eight goals. I remember Kerry put up seven goals and Kerry around twenty fourteen, but I can't remember how many points they. Kildare, yeah, I'll it was Kildare that wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Well, maybe not. Maybe maybe I'm quoting it wrong then, but. No, you could be right, but that is yeah, that's a shock. The, like, the, the whole thing, about, like, Park Choice came in and, and uh, gave a couple of very entertaining interviews. One in particular, Keith Duggan, where he was talking about philosophy and how he's going to appeal to the, you know, the, the Galway traditions, attacking football and all this, and uh, it all looked good for a time. But then if you are going to appeal to attacking instincts, why would you have brought in Jim McGuinness for a secret session? And if that particular session, I think I've said this before last week, if that particular session wasn't videoed, would Jim McGinnis still be there? Because it appears now that they kind of, you know, they might need him. Like, you know, they might actually could benefit with someone like that on the sideline. Uh, or maybe they just caught Kerry on one of those incredible days where Kerry, like no other team, are able to polish you off. Like, well, maybe the present day dub is like, but traditionally Kerry have handed out beatings like that since time memorial. Uh, but that is an alarming slide and you have done that you've done you've crunched the numbers far better than I have on that. That is that must be causing serious consternation down out west. Yeah, but nobody should be conceding four twenty one. I mean that that is horrific. Like there's triple scores. Like if you lose a game by double scores it's considered embarrassing. But triple scores is it's almost unforgivable. Mm. You know, and yeah. where, 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 to, where to for Galway? You know, because people were getting restless and frustrated with sometimes dour football as it was considered under Kevin Walsh. But they, they were moving up the rankings, albeit maybe a little bit slowly and maybe they were taking a step forward and maybe a step back at times. But, I mean, I don't think they suffered a defeat quite like this. Well, it was only just last week there in the, the arrival uh, podcast that uh, Andy Moore and Padre Andrews were talking about just how competitive Galway had become under Kevin Walsh. Like that, you know, you can s say what you want about the style of football. And quite frequently, some of that stuff's overplayed. Like, I mean, even just in, in the Sunday Independent piece by Joe Brawley, he was accrediting Galway's approach to, you know, the, the, the need to detaliate 
ification, you know. I mean, Paddy Talley hasn't been involved in Galway football for years and years now. Like, you know, what is it, three years since he was there? And to kind of put a, a label on them that this is in some way Paddy Talley's fault. I mean, no team that Paddy Talley ever coached was going to ever concede that amount of uh, scores. So it's, it's a lunatic. It's just nonsense like that they that they are defensive because you don't concede that amount by being a defensive team. Where to now? Let's let's hold off for another couple of games and see what's what's in them. Um, but that it could be just one of those days, it, and it happens though. It does happen to teams where they get a trim. And I remember going down to uh, Killarney. Was it 2014 or 2015 where James Donahue scored three goals against Tron and they absolutely annihilated them one day down there? Uh, it wasn't pretty. And sometimes, just you can, you you can always, there's normally always one stinker of a performance that any team puts together in a league of seven games, but it's just magnified now when there's only three games. And Peter Keane said, no question about it, I wouldn't pay any attention to it, the result he's talking about. That result could have gone the other way just as handily. In normal circumstances, we've had a game like this behind closed doors as a challenge game at another county. I mean, talk about trying to sell us a pup. Oh, well, he's, Peter Keane's gone full Hilly Ray here, hasn't he? Um, and I think that you can get very precious and you can get very serious and say he's being disingenuous and he's not telling the, the general public what the truth it is. But, but like, you know, I mean, you should maybe just enjoy comments like that because they're just not rooted in reality. It's just a bit of comedy, like, you know. I Is it good for the game or who, who kind of cares? Like, you know, manager's quotes are all right, uh, <laughs> for what they are <laughs> but Peter Keane has clearly decided that I'm not actually going to tell the truth or be honest in any way or I'm just going to kind of spoof my way through it so I mean people shouldn't maybe just pay all that much attention to what he says Do you, um, do you think they take this as a sign to 421 that Kerry have really departed from what was a fairly cautious approach against Cork last year you know Brian O'Beugley and Ronan Buckley were the two wing forwards for example whereas here you know, I've read out some of the guys who did the scoring, but you have a forward line with Paddy Clifford, Killian Spillane, David Clifford, Paul Ganey, Sean O'Shea, Darren Moynihan, and then a ball player like David Moore at midfield, never mind the backs who can actually um, who can fly up the wings too. Yeah, too, but, but you have to remember too, though, that when Kerry were overturning the ball and they won a few turnovers, like what you had was Paddy Clifford and David Clifford were right back there. So, I mean, if they're willing to work hard like that, like, uh, you know, in inverted commas, a wing back or a corner back playing at half forward, then really you've got the best of both worlds. Like, you know, they were absolutely flying fit, so they were able to get back up the pitch. Uh, if that had been a tighter game, would the fitness slowly just, you know, like a like air leaving a balloon, would that be a factor in tighter games? Perhaps so. Uh, but I mean, we we talked at length about this with the need for Kerry to be Kerry um, last week, and um, it appears that the, the first step in that road has been taken. Mm, absolutely. So we'll keep an eye on that. But one final point as we uh, as we play out: Have you ever seen a silkier score than than David Clifford's finish against Galway? There. Yes. Yes. Um, Jimmy Clark did exactly the same thing against St. Gauls in an Ulster Club game up in uh, Casement Park in, do, 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 I think, I think 2011. But Jimmy actually went to kick it and the St. Gauls defender was flying across the ground. So very, very similar. But what Jimmy did is he actually dragged it back with his left foot. He went to kick it and he did a Cruyff turn, but it wasn't a turn, if you know what I mean. He just basically shifted the ball across his body behind his standing right foot and then kicked it in with his right foot. Uh, it, uh, you know, Ulster club games, you know, provincial club games like that, you're, you're never going to uh, get the footage of it. But it, I remember at the time just absolutely drooling over it. Like, you know, but he did the same, it was the same effect. He sent goalkeeper. And I think about three defenders flying in one direction. Mm. But yeah, like, you know, Actually, when you look at David Clifford, he just put the toe of his boot on the ball, like the mastery of uh, how, as a soccer lad says, how he manipulated the ball. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, but I actually, do you know what comes to mind for me? It's a completely different type of skill, but it was just, not that it was overly difficult, but the way Colin McFadden did the feint in 2014 to go around uh, Stephen Cluxon, there was just something majestic. He, yes. He just sent him for a tax. It was just glorious. So. McFadden was brilliant at that. He just yeah. threw the ball out to one arm and bring it back in. Mm. He was and, fantastic at that. And anyone get your comments in and let us know. So just a reminder, we're brought to you by orgoretro.com. If you want to get this Donegal jersey or any other shirt, with 15% off, go to orgoretro.com and use the promo code OURGAME. Thanks very much, Declan. Thank you, Shane.